We are uh, in a uh, series on biblical politics, and um, I want to talk today a little bit about um, that person we all uh, know. Uh, everyone has somebody in their family, it could be on your neighborhood, it could be in your friend group. That person you always think twice about inviting to something because you know that if they come, somewhere along the line, there's going to be hurt feelings and an argument off in the corner somewhere, right? And uh, we may think of that person as contentious, but they view themselves as passionate. Um, hopefully, you're not that person. Uh, I've been that person at times, but we won't talk about me today. Uh, so what I want to start with is, is just kind of ask this question. Is what's the difference between being passionate and contentious? Um, because like I say, I, think, I don't think most people see themselves as contentious. They have a different word for what they are. It could be passion. It could just be right. Um, that right there will tell you a little bit of the difference. What's the difference between passion, uh, passion and contentious? Again, all these notes are, are in, the, in the app. Uh, if you don't like to write stuff down, most of it's already there for you. So um, according to the dictionary, passionate is expressing intense driving or a dominant feeling or conviction, right? It, it's something that you really, really care about, whereas contentious is exhibiting an often perverse or wearisome tendency to quarrels and disputes. Now, now, you could be passionate in that, but it's really the end result. So I, I was, as I was processing this, I thought of a few ways maybe to distinct. A passionate person loves to share their love of a topic, a thing, or a person, right? It could be a particular kind of uh, movie. It might be something uh, political. It may be something religious. It may be whatever it is, right? They, they, have, they love to just share this topic, this thing, or this person. Whereas a contentious person likes to argue with the intent of setting others straight, See, one person's trying to share their love. Another person's basically trying to say, you're an idiot. Let me tell you why. All right? A passionate person may attempt to win you over to, their, to whatever it is that they love, but a contentious person will bowl you over. Right? Uh, uh, there's a difference between trying to win folks over and then there's just like a, just an overwhelming bowling people over, overwhelming them. Unfortunately, let me, can I just tell you that uh, the passionate thing, I had to work really hard coming up with something. The contentious, I didn't because I've been a very contentious person. So just full disclosure, I lean that way. I, in my nature, I lean towards contention um, because I'm right. <laughs> See what I mean? Nobody laughed harder than my wife at that class comment. <laughs> a passionate person loses uh, time when they're talking about their favorite topic, thing, or person. It's just, it just, it just, they don't realize how long they were talking or what, because it, it's something they love. But a, a contentious person steals your time trying to bludgeon you with their perspective, right? A, a passionate person, as long as you're willing to listen, they're willing to talk. But a contentious person will follow you. Right, and keep insisting. Well, you don't understand, you understand, da 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 da. A passionate person understands they are a bit out of balance in their passion. They actually maybe can laugh a little bit too at the fact that they're maybe a little over whacked and you know that they love this this thing so much. Whereas a contentious person is convinced the entire world should take the matter as serious as they. And anyone who doesn't is obviously an idiot. Now I hope that unlike myself, you could not relate at all to the contentious person, at least personally. Maybe, again, you probably know someone. Unfortunately for myself and maybe a few in this room, the contentious thing we understand. And so when we, today we're going to talk about the spirit of debate or the spirit of communication. right? And one of the, the, the main differences between a passionate person and a contentious person person is the spirit in the room. A passionate person, the, the spirit in the room is, yeah, this person obviously cares so much 
about this thing, right? Life doesn't raise and fall on this, let's say this really, you know, the prince's bride, let's say, right? But you can tell when they start talking about the movie, they're really, you know, into it and whatnot. But the whole, the, the mood in the room is just kind of, will give them their 15 minutes, right? <laughs> but a contentious person sucks the air out of the room. Nobody wants to be there but them. And they kind of place themselves, if you would, by the door to make sure everybody, nobody escapes, <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's the spirit of our communication. It's the spirit of our debate. And so Paul actually addresses this, not directly, not politics, but the spirit of debate, the spirit of discussion, if you would, in his letter to a, to a, uh, a young shepherd of God's people named Titus. And so if you have a, a Bible, if you open up to Titus, we're going to start uh, about two-thirds through the, level, uh, the letter. And um, we've, we've put chapters and verses in so we can find our way around. So Titus chapter 3. And he starts by giving, here's positive. He says to this young shepherd, hey, here in the positive, this is what I want you to relay to the church of Jesus Christ. So like Titus, I need to relay the same things to you. And Paul writes this. He says, remind the people of the church, that is, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle towards everyone. Okay? So he, he basically says, I, I want you to, to, to go out of your way to remind folks, these are things that they've been taught but we need to be told again, right? There's a reason we're doing a series on biblical politics this year, right? You, you all know most of this stuff. But if there's any time that we need to be reminded, <laughs> it's this year. <laughs> it's this year, which we all know is already starting to be and will end up a very contentious year. So then he gives us this kind of list of what, what are you to remind them to do? So number one, the, actually the first three things has to do with this first statement. We're supposed to remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities. In other words, you and I don't get, as followers of Jesus, now that's the qualifier, as followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus don't get to choose whether they obey or show respect to the politicians they like. We are called to honor and respect and obey both sides. Both sides. And then he's got two more statements in relation to rulers and authorities. The first is be obedient. Be obedient. As, as followers of Jesus, again, our first allegiance is to Jesus, but we must obey our government and its leaders as well to the degree that they don't cross the line of our love and respect for God. So that's primarily has to do with our worship. So for instance, several years ago, right, the government said um, that in order to meet, in order for people to be safe, right, you needed to meet with a certain amount of number of people, right, I think it was 60. So we went for multiple services, so we made sure to get under that 60. Remember, we met out in the courtyard, and we, and we put the six feet between us and other households and all that kind of, kind of stuff because no one's going to stand before God and God going, I can't believe you put six feet between you and the person next to you. God's not going to be upset about that, right? Now, if the government had said you cannot meet at all, if the government begins to say that there's things that we can and cannot teach, which if you don't pay attention, they're beginning to, then we will disobey because God has been very clear. This is truth. You've got to teach truth, right? We, we, we have to worship our Lord. We cannot worship our Lord. But in terms of stop on red, go on green, pay taxes on this land, um, have this kind of training in your workplace. I mean, we, we are supposed to obey, but not just obey, there's this, there's, this, there's this attitude, look at the very next one, be ready for every good deed. See, there's, there's kind of this attitude. There's obey in, in that, you know, most of us paid some sort of taxes, right? And we had to have that in here in a couple weeks ago, right? But also most people paid them begrudgingly. 
Now, I wasn't dancing and praising the Lord when I paid my taxes, all right? I'm not necessarily su uh, suggesting that, but, I, but what I am suggesting is that, is that we should be ready to support. We should be ready to, we, we need to work on our attitude so that everything is like, well, I have to do whatever, but I'm not going to do it with any kind of good attitude. For, for the believer of Christ, he wants us to not only be subject to rules and authorities and, and be obedient, but to, to do it, ready to do a good deed, ready to be a blessing, if you would. We must be responsible citizens. I believe what we should vote. I believe every vote uh, matters. That there is even things in California that are really uh, uh, iron sharp uh, in terms of which way they can go. And it's important that we vote. It's important that we participate. But we participate with the right attitude, with the right heart, with the right example. See, the proper attitude toward the secular rulers and authorities is submission, obedience, and a readiness to do whatever is good. That's, that, that's what Paul's saying. He's Paul saying to another pastor, remind folks of this. So as we come up on, on election, right, uh, I'm, many of you are going to be really happy maybe with the result, and many of you are going to be really hurt by the result. Some of us, it doesn't matter the result, we'll still be unhappy, right? <laughs> but whoever and whatever the end result is, our attitude should be, one, A, accepting, well, God has allowed this. I'm not saying that God chose it. I'm not saying God blessed it, but God has allowed this. And he has called me to pray for, to be respectful for, to speak positively about, right? Some of you remember in the very first week of the series, I, I kind of showed you my bias, and I said one of my favorite political commentators is a Democrat, um, uh, Henry Ford Jr. And part of it is, is because he almost always starts with saying where we have the common ground. Um, he, he absolutely disagrees. He absolutely has an opinion, but he starts with showing respect. He, sh uh, uh, he starts with saying, well, I appreciate this about this this person, I, I, I feel he really models this spirit. That doesn't mean I agree with everything he says, right? It, but it's, I agree with the way he says it, the heart that he says it in. Now, this next section we're going we're gonna to say is focused more broadly to all. We're going to get there at the, at the very end, right, where he says, um, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle towards everyone. So that gentle towards everyone it says this is, should be our attitude towards all people, right? The, the first is, is to slander no one. In other words, this is basically forbidding us. Just, it's not just gossip and, and spreading rumors, untruths, which, by the way, um, we are guilty of. Right? You've heard me mention how I've, I've gotten emails. We send each other emails. We send each other posts before we check whether or not this is really true about this politician or this person or whatever. And I would say about 50% of the same things that I received, did you know this is true, turn out not to be true. If somebody just did a, a basic search on, is this, are they really going to tax this email? Are they really trying to take away this religious freedom or whatever it may be? It'd be, oh, they're not. But we just react. We just react. And so we, we are proponents of, of lies. We are proponents of, of un, untruths. But it's not just rumors and, and whatnot. I think this, this whole idea of slander is, is when it's evident, when someone says, I know that Joel King has no love for X person. I know that I've been slanderous. If someone says that about me, what basically what they're said is, is that whenever he gets to this person, <laughs> he's got nothing good to say. In other words, I'm constantly tearing down that person. And it's evident to the people in my life that I have a negative attitude towards and that I dislike. They might use the word hate. I don't hate anybody, but that's what I've communicated, that I hate this person. To me, that is the spirit of slander he's talking about. That he's asking believers to absolutely positively be different and avoid. We are supposed to be peaceable and gentle, right? We, we, we demonstrate gentleness by avoiding quarrels. It doesn't mean we don't have disagreements, 
It means in, in parenting, uh, my wife and I have this thing about it's very important to know what hills to die on. And what we mean by that is there are some things that you're going to go, that won't fly in this household, right? But the way they arrange their clothes in the drawer may not be one of them. <laughs> um, or just, or just we've, we have, now that they're young adults, we have just dropped the clean up your room thing. It's not a hill worth dying on. It's not worth fighting for, right? Kind of, kind of, a, kind of a thing. And so this, this idea of, of, of um, being peaceable and gentle is being the kind of person um, who approaches situation with a gentle heart that's more geared towards bringing peace than bringing, it's the opposite of being a contentious person. Um, probably a great example of this, some of you actually uh, uh, know um, uh, elder here that used to be here named Tom Green. But if you don't, don't, don't know him, don't worry about it. But, but uh, those of us who knew Tom Green, especially among the elders, we used to call Tom the Velvet Hammer. The Velvet Hammer. And that was because Tom had two things going on at, at one time. First of all, he was an agreeable, peaceful, loving person. You knew Tom was for you. He was, he was the kind of person you want to know and hang out with. But he was also a leader. And so Tom, Tom did kind of address things and say, man, this needs to be correct or whatnot. But, but when he did it, it was like a velvet hammer. He pounded you, but he was so nice when he did it. <laughs> right? You, 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 were, you felt encouraged that he would take the time to let you know something had to change. Right? Unlike, unlike, unlike myself, and I struggle with this, right? I'm early Simon Cowell is my, is my bent. <laughs> You're an idiot. How could you? That's so stupid. Right? I was, I, that's not being peaceable. That's not being gentle. It, is, it has been God's work in my life to learn to be peaceable and gentle. And many of you will tell me I'm still working on it. I'm not going to argue with you. But this is the goal. Not that there's not disagreements among us, but the way, but the way we address it is in, the, is in the spirit of peace and gentleness, showing every consideration, really this root word means humility to all. That, that we approach people not as better, and not that we're right and you're wrong, but we approach people with a humility. For, like we're looking out for their good, like we appreciate who God's designed to be, even though you may or may not agree with me on certain things, right? I understand you have value. I understand that you're loved by God and that you're precious in his sight. That is, that is the spirit that, that he wants believers to have. That's what we should be known for. That should be our reputation, if you would. That was Jesus' reputation. Jesus did not water things down. I think, I think people have this idea, well, Jesus was loving and he accepted everybody. And when they say accepting, it means like he agreed that everybody was okay. That's a bunch of baloney. You're not reading the same Bible I am. Because what Jesus did is Jesus said, hey, you know, you know this bar about you shouldn't cheat on your spouse? Um, well, I tell you, if you just think about it, You've done it. You know this bar about you shouldn't murder? I tell you, if you just call somebody an idiot, you're guilty of that. To me, that's not saying you're okay, right? When he, when he, when he, when he approached someone and said, hey, you know what? Uh, all these people are condemning you. I don't condemn you. You know what his next sentence was? Go sin no more. Stop that. Change that. That is wrong. But in the midst, talk about a velvet hammer. In the midst of that, he was able to look at people in a non-condemning, I am for you kind of way, which people loved. Even though he kept raising them, people loved that because he accepted them for where they're at. You know, the only people that he drove crazy were the religious people. Why? Because they were contentious. They had the same wiring that I have, right? They, they got their superiority and their positive feelings by looking down on others. That's the spirit we're supposed to have. The same spirit of Christ, right? Who did not feel that, that, that equality with God is something he had to grasp. In other words, he was equal with God. And yet he left the throne, 
became like a servant, that's you and I, and then he served rather than be served, even unto death on a cross. That's our attitude. And then he says the why. Why should we do this? Why should we have this attitude? Okay, this comes from uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Okay, it says this. Let me just start with verse 3. At one time, we too. So Paul's including him in the self. So he's saying, saying, listen, folks, you need to remember. This is easy to forget. You need to remember. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. As he kind of goes through the why, he says, is that, you know, while you're, you remember that whole thing, while you point a finger at someone else, there's three pointing back at you. This is Paul's basic point here. Why would we be contentious with the world when we were just like the world? <laughs> Don't forget that we too were, were foolish. The way the Bible calls a fool, a fool is someone who's proud and arrogant. They scorn wisdom. They trust only in themselves. They persist in their foolishness, they persist in their rejection of God. They're disobedient. They don't care what God thinks. They're going to do things their way. They're going to live by my truth. This is my truth. That's how I define reality, by my truth. They were deceived. In other words, they believed the lies of the world. And we get frustrated over people who are like, how can you fall for that? Well, you know what? You're forgetting that you fell for it. This is the thing that... that uh, I constantly have to remind myself as a parent. I'm constantly find myself complaining to myself at the stupidity of the, some of the decisions my young adults are making, which by the way, for the most part, they're doing a really good job, okay? But because of the way I'm bent, I focus on the things they're not doing well. And then the Spirit of the Lord comes along and says, now let's see, what were you doing at that age? <laughs> And it's so easy for us to forget the idiots that we were, right? And we start treating people like, well, I had it figured out from birth, <laughs> right? And you're all laughing because you know that wasn't true. And most of us still don't have it figured out. But, but um, like uh, for those of you who know Tim Ryan, he's always saying, right, we want God's grace when it comes to us and God's justice when it comes to others. And what Paul's saying is, is remember that you needed God's grace, that you were foolish, disobedient, deceived, that you were enslaved to your passions, to your lusts and pleasures, and that basically you said, if it feels good, this is what I'm going to do, right? And many of us followed that path, and where did that path lead? Slavery. We thought it was freedom. I'm free to smoke it, I'm free to drink it, I'm free to say it, I'm free to do it, I'm free to whatever, and then as we got down that path, we realized this thing has enslaved me. That was us. Why do we make such a big deal about them and we forget that was us? That was us. And even if it wasn't you literally, right? Like I said, you didn't murder anyone. When you get to Jesus' standard, he says, all of us have in one way murdered people by the way we've spoken about them, right? You might not have used a drug, but all of us have tried to take feelings and cover it up in a worldly way. Every single one of us. And he reminds us that in, we, in our past, we were... Uh, in malice, we were people that wanted to harm one another, like the world. We were envious. We wanted what others have. We were being hated. In other words, no matter how much the world says, all we need is love, right? What they really mean is all we need is love is all we need is for you to love the things that I love. And then we'll all get along. That's really what that means. When it first came out, it seemed like, it seemed like a wonderful thing, though it came out the year that the Beatles broke up. But that's besides the point. We were being hated and we hated one another. That was our past. Don't forget that. And don't forget the change. Right? Don't forget the change in verses 3 through, uh, I'm sorry, 4 through 7. He says, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, he might become, I'm sorry, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal 
life. So he reminds us that we were, going, we were going along in life, and we didn't all of a sudden wake up and go, you know what, my life is terrible, God is right, I am wrong, and I'm going to change my life. He reminds us that was not the case, right? But at some point, we encounter God's kindness and love that, that were, where God entered in, and it was, notice here it says that, we, that God, the love of God, our Savior, that's the Father, Right? At the time that we responded to the good news, we were saved from our old life. But we were saved, like all those things, the, all those things that, that he just listed, we were saved for our foolishness, our disobedience, our envy, our hating. We were saved from that. We were saved from the, the things that were enslaving us. And most importantly, we were saved from eternally being separated from God at that, at that time. But, we were, but that happened not because of our good deeds that we have done. See, we go around in politics often and we make this argument, I can't believe the world won't, I can't believe the world won't, and we forgot that we wouldn't until God did. Like, like we have this great amount of self-control, like we were just so wise and God is lucky to have us. We're lucky to have him. We are no different than the world. That's what Paul's saying. Remember, you're no different. It wasn't because of your good deeds, what? But it was because of God's mercy that we, that we were washed and made new, what? By the Holy Spirit. Again, now notice now the Holy Spirit's involved in salvation. It's a holy, this whole idea of, of washed and made new refers uh, to the whole idea of the temple, right? You have a, a cup, and you're going to use it in the temple to worship God. But the, the cup is just a cup. So what, w- what you would do is you would wash the cup. You would, you would make it, sanctify it with blood. And now, and now it was to be used for holy, set-apart things unto God. And this whole idea is that, is that we were separated from God, but God wanted to save us, right? God loved us so much that he gave his son so that we may not perish but have eternal life. At that moment that we receive that gift, the Son, the Holy Spirit comes in our life. By the blood of Jesus, which he's about to get to, we are made clean. He washes us. He makes us new. He renews us. And so we have rebirth. We're a new creation. We're no longer the old person. We're new. But the only reason we can see the world for what it is now it's because we've been reborn. And the only reason we're reborn is because the Holy Spirit was in our life. And the only reason the Holy Spirit was in our life is because God did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. So, to, so to look at somebody in the world and start going nutty because they don't see God and the world the way you do is in self nutty. It's like saying, I can't, I can't believe you know, the, the five-year-old can't make this logical leap. Well, you know they're five. You don't expect them to make that logical leap. They're not supposed to know that five cookies before dinner is not a good thing. A five-year-old is supposed to think it's absolutely the best thing. As a matter of fact, it should be six cookies. But yet we look at the world and we forget they're five-year-olds. Now, I'm not, I'm not really saying they're five-year-olds. I'm just follow my example, right? We look at the world and they're not renewed. They're not, they haven't been, been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And yet we treat them as if they should. And, and he's saying, you have no reason to be prideful because that was you. You were the five-year-old. And all this, verse 6, came through what? Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, who is our Savior. Notice Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, all this came through his sacrifice. This is the good news. And therefore, verse 7, what we are justified, we are made right with God, not because we finally got it together, not because we have finally got our vote right, we started attending church, but by his grace, by what he did for us. Because Jesus took the punishment we deserved for sin and justified us. Right? We need to stop taking credit. Um, like, look at, look at everything I have. Right? And mommy and daddy left it to you. And that's in essence what, we're do, what we do. We go around saying, why can't the world be like me? And it's like, wait a second. What did you do? Nothing. It was mommy and daddy who gave everything that you have. You, are, you have millions, your life's successful, you were able to go to college or whatever thing was you had because they had the money and did it for you. In essence, he's saying the same thing. 
You don't deserve where you're at. You, you're not the one who often woke up and got smart. God did something for you that you could not do yourself. God is the one who changed you. So stop talking as if you did something. And remember, you didn't, that he did. And the result of that is that we were made heirs. In other words, we have an inheritance, again, that we didn't deserve. God didn't come down to the human orphanage and go, okay, I only want the most worthy ones. I'll take Mary. Right? No, what he, matter of fact, he usually does quite the opposite. God comes down to earth and goes, okay, who's the one that if I choose everybody go, well, it must have been God. Ooh, I know a contentious, self-righteous, arrogant person. I'll take Joel King. I'll take him because if I can start turning humility in him, then everybody who knows him will go, there must be a God. <laughs> I don't recognize that person anymore. I didn't grow up with that Joel. Verse 8, he says this. He says, this is a trustworthy saying. In other words, the gospel that he just talked about. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. So that those who have trusted in God and may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. In other words, if you're going to speak confidently about something, you're speaking boldly about something, speak boldly about the good news. About what God did for us that we could not do, our, do ourselves. And if you want to devote yourself, you're going to be passionate about something, be passionate about what God did for us. That's what we should be passionate about. And so he gives us these three reasons why we should be humble. Number one, our past condition was shameful. We did not love God nor other people. We had no basis for our pride, just like the world. Number two, we were unable to save ourselves. We're not good enough, and there's nothing that we could have done to make ourselves better. Number three, we have the hope of eternal life by God's grace. And it's not based on our performance. So when we approach the world in that light, we should be able to approach them in gentleness because we realize I was five too. I was there too, and there's nothing special about me. And then he ends with what I call the negative. He said, this is what I want you to be like. Then he says, this is why I want you to be like it. And then he says, be careful of the opposite. And, and by the way, he's talking to Christians. You and I, followers of Jesus. And he says this. He says, starting in uh, verse 9 here, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because the, these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, you have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and they are self-condemned. He basically says, avoid these people. Avoid... Folks who all they ever do is lead people to foolish controversies, genealogies, strife, and disputes about the law. Here's the thing. In the context, we really don't know exactly what he's talking about. God did not feel like we needed to know the specifics. And probably is because if we knew the specifics of them, then it'd be easiest for us to say, well, that doesn't apply to me. What he's saying is this, is that there are some people that, that are followers of Jesus that are geared towards gentleness and peace and love and, and seeing people through the, through, through the Jesus land. And then there's other people. They may be in church. They may have high self-discipline. They may go to Bible studies, right? But they fundamentally see themselves as better than others. They fund, fundamentally get, get down in the minutia, folks. Maybe they argue over the music, the painting of the church, the condition of the kitchen, one or two political situations, how you do vote, how you don't vote. And they stop seeing people and they start, all they see is a reason that the rest of the world needs to know and believe what they know and believe. But they use the Bible and Jesus to justify, quite frankly, their hate. And they're just argumentative. They're just argumentative. And he says, he says, avoid these kind of folks. He says, and if, if, if the person is contentious, give them two warnings. Come to them and say, listen, this is divisive. You're not helping anyone. You're not going to convince anyone, right, that we have to use the King James Version of the Bible. I don't care what version you use. Do what you understand. You'll be fine. Read the message. If you just do what the message says. The translation I'm talking about. 
Okay. Okay. But we want to make these, we want to make this big deal about these little things. Why? So we can basically ignore doing it. And we can feel good about, well, we got the translation right. We got our vote right. We got this right. We got that right. But what he says is go to that person and he says, warn them. This, is, this isn't helping the kingdom. This isn't helping people come to Jesus. Then reject them as a brother or sister in Christ because they are committed to divisiveness and self-condemned sinner who won't repent. In other words, they basically said that my way and what I believe is more important than Christ and, the, and his church. Now, I'm not talking about Jesus, again, back to Jesus, told the truth. I'm not saying, man, we should avoid offending people and saying, well, God doesn't believe in that, especially within the church. Maybe not outside the church, but definitely within the church. But we all know those folks that will make a mountain out of a molehill. So, of course, you're going to come up and lead us in one last song and and I want to talk about this question that I said I would address today. How passionate should we be about political matters? And, and I would just say you have, to, you, have, you have to discern this. Our heart should break for the things that break the heart of God. But our number one passion should be God's number one passion, which is the good news. It's not a virtue. It's not that we get the right person in office. It's not, even, it's not even that we protect certain folks, though that does break his heart. But the, that everybody, the rich and the poor, the woke and the unwoke, the east and the west, the male and the female, that they may hear and get the opportunity to understand and know that God loves them through the good news. Our attitude should reflect the humility of Christ who came not to be served, but to serve and has laid his life down for the many. So here it is. You want to evaluate this? Go home and sit before the Lord and just do this. Would the people around you say you're passionate for Jesus or that you're contentious? Would the people who read your Facebook or social media posts, I know there's lots of other more things bigger than Facebook now, right? Whatever it is, would your family say that you're passionate for Jesus or that you're contentious? And if they say you were passionate for Jesus, would they say that that you're passionate that hurt, lost, broken people understand that God did for them what they could not do for themselves. So they say your passion for Jesus in that, you know, you're always bugging them. They got to go to church. They got to read their Bible. Because those are two different things. I think those, that, that second category is important, but it's all about the first. Ask God to examine you. I hope you guys do better at this than I have. God's got a whole long list for me. But I'm growing, and that's the goal, is to take one more step and be a little less contentious and a little bit more like Jesus. Amen? Lord, would you do that work in us and through us by your grace? May we stop looking at people as the world does, valuing them, dear Father, only whether or not they agree with us, and start looking at them through your eyes, the way you looked at us. Will you do this miracle in our hearts? In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.